Um, I'm a board member with Western Cuyahoga Audubon and a bird walk coordinator. Next slide, please. But Nancy, do you have a pop-up or something at the bottom of your screen that you need to, because it's the formatting is a little off. We can't um, see. It the... won't. It's not coming. Yeah, there it comes. It's okay, off. Excellent. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to cover our upcoming bird walks biggest day with David Lindo event and invite you to connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. Might take a little while for my screen to change. Looks like I'm having some. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, no, no, there you go. Okay. Ah. Oh, no. Oh. Okay. I'm sp I think we need to be one back. There. There it is. Thank you. Okay. So please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. The next one is um, Saturday, May 13th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in May, we had good looks at flycatchers, scarlet tanagers, a rose-breasted grosbeak, a Philadelphia vireo, and our resident barred owl. So please join us this month to see what nature has in store for this year. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this past second Saturday was held on April 8th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. Um, he says the April 2023 second Saturday of the month bird walk started with a cold temperature of 35 degrees and ended with a temperature at 47 degrees. It was sunny the entire walk. 23 observers tallied 43 species. Um, the expected birds were observed. Some migrants have arrived. Three Phoebes, one yellow-bellied sapsucker, four golden crown kinglets, and five hermit thrush were present. Highlights were the red-tailed hawk back on the same nest as last year and a pair of pie-bill greaves in the West Channel Pond. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for our Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. The next one is on May 27th at 9 a.m., meeting at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue between West 13th Street and the I-90 Interbelt Bridge. Uh, Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk, and they will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. Next slide, please. So our very popular evening bird walk series is starting up again in May this year. Um, this walk takes place the third Wednesday of every month through September, meeting at a different location each month. This month, we will kick off the series at the Little Met Wetland and Rocky River Reservation, a meeting at the Big Met Golf Course parking lot at 6 p.m. Nancy Howell um, will lead this walk for us. Next slide. All right, David Lindo is coming back to visit us this Saturday, May 6th. The day will consist of a morning joint bird walk with Western Reserve Land Conservancy at Brighton Park, and that is full and registration only. Um, we will have an opportunity to do lunch with David at Market Garden Brewery, and we still have a few spots open for that lunch. Um, I will put a link in the chat to register for that if you're interested um, after my announcements this evening. Um, then we'll have an afternoon bird walk at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve at 3 p.m. and that is open to everyone. Um, and then a group dinner with David at Sibling Revelry Brewing, um, which is also full. After spending the day with us, David will travel west where he will be a keynote speaker and lead a bird walk at the biggest week in American Birding Festival. So that is super exciting and it will be great to see our friend again. So please uh, join us this Saturday. Next slide, please. All right, finally, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Always good information and exciting bird walks that we have happening. Alrighty.
Our next, our next presenter is uh, Drina Nemes, who uh, does our book discussion. Drina. Good evening, everybody. And I just want to comment on the beautiful pictures that uh, have been in the presentation so far, both Nancy's and Michelle's beautiful bird photographs. Next slide, please. Sorry. We just finished up our year and um, we read three books, Hurricane Lizard's Plastic Squid, Pige a, a Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, and A World on the Wing. And these were just great books. And uh, I continue to recommend them. And uh, we now have a link to the book discussions, uh, YouTube videos. It's at the top of your screen. Uh, we just got that in place, thanks to Heather. Um, next slide, please. Well, next season, we have our date set at least. And um, we've been aiming for the third Tuesdays, but it uh, doesn't quite work in April. So that's the fourth Thursday, Tuesday, excuse me. And um, I'm uh, having a little challenge trying to select uh, three books because there are so many, but it's down to four books right now. So hope to have it make a decision very soon. Next slide, please. So yes, David Lindo's coming uh, this weekend and he is an author too. And I thought I would just show uh, some of his books. And uh, this world, the book, The Extraordinary World of Birds, I didn't realize that this, that he had written this. And this is book written for children. And then his, uh, like his main topic being an urban birder, how to be an urban birder. Next slide, please. And by the way, Drina, we still have about three copies of how to be an urban birder. Oh. I don't know if Michelle has any extra copies, but I know I have three. And they, okay. will be avail and they will be available for sale. So if anyone's interested. Okay. And then he has also another book called The Urban Birder. And then Tales from Concrete Jungles. Next slide, please. Um, there, I think we're ahead of a slide or so. Okay, yes. Sorry and maybe even another slide ahead. Okay, I guess I'm wrong. Okay, um, also David Lindo has a, a webinar series called In Conservation With, and this is just great interviews with um, some famous and, and not so famous to me, uh, figures in natural history and birding. And so you can find that at the uh, urbanbirderworld.com, his website, live webinars. And then also he had a just a really great interview with Scott Weidensall, which we talked about at our last book club meeting. So if you haven't read the book or you just wanna hear David interview him, it's a, it's a really wonderful interview, about an hour. Next slide, please. And then um, I like to mention uh, the Environment of the Americas organization and they have a wonderful book club the uh, usually the third Thursday of the month and um, they also have interviewed Scott Weidensall but coming up in May is another book about migration and this is a uh, fiction and it's uh it sounds like an intriguing story about a um, environmentalist activist who is going to track Arctic terns. And we learned from Scott Weidensall's book that Arctic terns kind of have the record for how many miles they um, travel per year. Originally, scientists estimated they flew about 25,000 miles a year, but that was pre-scientific geolocators. Once they got the geolocators on, they found can you believe it? Anywhere from 51 to 57,000 miles per year. They go from the Arctic Circle, the northern part of our globe, to the southern part of the globe. And this was all figured out because of this, the advancements in science. Next slide, please. 
and the Environment of Americas is the sponsor of World Migratory Day, Bird Day, and which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So there's a, a lot of excitement about it. If you go to uh, Environment of the Americas website, you can find out a lot of information. This is such a good organization for environmentalism and training the next generation of environmentalists, especially related to migration. So uh, World Migratory Bird Day is coming up May 13th and then also October 14th. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, okay, okay. thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Drina. Always chock full of information, really appreciate it. Well, Marianne Romito is our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Marianne, how are you this evening? Oh, I'm just ducky there, Nancy, thank you. <laughs> I think we're all ducky. Yeah, we're all ducky with this lovely weather. Um, I'm, I'm the coordinator for Northeast Ohio for a Climate Watch, which is a program that Audubon started, uh, National Audubon started. We last winter had our first group Climate Watch, and this year, well, this summer, between May 15th, next slide, and June 15th, we're going to do a summer count. So I'm looking for volunteers. Um, I do have a, a selection of volunteers already. And if, you, if you're one of those volunteers who um, volunteered last year, just send me an email. Let me know that you're still going to participate. I'd appreciate that. And if you'd like to participate, please send me um, an email to my email here, which I'll put in the chat after I get done talking. So that um, I'd like to like to hear from you. See if you'd like to join in on the summertime climate watch. Any questions? So we're just gonna. Looks like we just have a day, one day that's more or less selected for that climate watch. Is that right? Yes. Yes. It does. Run, the program does run from May fifteenth to June fifteenth. But as a group, we thought we'd 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 pick Saturday, June third to just make a big blast to go out there and, and do a climate watch and have everybody do it. So but, we but we're not we're not that you'll join us and um um have a good time. Oh one thing I do want to mention is that if you want to watch that there the, the top the top note up here if you want to um watch a re the review of the program that I gave last fall on Climate Watch, you can go to that that link there and go about 17 minutes in because that's where my my talk starts. Um, I do talk about the Audubon app in the um, in in the program. I'm not recommending we use that this year because we had a lot of difficulty with it last winter time. I'm suggesting that we should re re use the paper method or the eBird method for recording your bird sightings. So, and we're still focusing on goldfinch and white-breasted nuthatch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marianne, appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being the coordinator, not just for Cuyahoga County, but all of Northeast Ohio. So there's lots of counties that Marianne has yes. to be responsible for. Oh gosh, it's me again, how about that? I just wanted to mention a couple of quick things on our website. Um, in our store, we do offer birds and beans, bird-friendly coffee. Um, it is 100% Smithsonian certified bird-friendly. So it's shade-grown, organic, fair trade. I mean, just, just about everything is good about it. Um, remember the birds that we are, that are gradually making their way northward now, spent much of their time in Central or South America. Um, and some of that was in maybe in coffee plantations. Um, the shade grown means that they're, the coffee plants are grown in the shade of the native trees of the rainforest. And uh, which means there's habitat for those migrants down in Central and South America. So uh, we send our order in quarterly. Uh, the last order was sent in in April. So the next order won't be placed until July. July 10th will be the final date, but you'll be getting updates. 
Um, so drink up, I wrote drink up that cold brew. I don't know about cold brew, but certainly uh, think about ordering. There's a lot of different varieties. You can get uh, different grinds. You can get whole bean. There's just a lot of offerings. So check out our, our homepage with the Bird Friendly Coffee Club. Now, besides birding, a lot of us like to garden or grow things. And we also have tilth soil that is for sale uh, on our website. Tilth soil is produced um, from composted food waste, which is kept from landfills. And it's produced in Cleveland by Rust Belt Riders. Perhaps you've heard of the organization. Um, they take the, the composted food waste, they will mix it with sand, maybe some uh, other organic materials. And then they have several soil types from which just choose. Uh, sprout, of course, seeds for sprouting seeds. Grow is something that can be tossed into uh, raised beds. Um, maybe amend your soil when you're putting in transplants. Bloom is to encourage uh, flowering and fruiting. And they even have a, a type of soil that you can use for your house plants too, called house. So again, check out our website. We have a nice button on our, uh, on our page and it says tilt soil. Um, order that from uh, the website. Uh, and once you order, that order comes into us. Uh, I send it into Tilth Soil. I pick up the, the bags of soil and I deliver them right to your home. So you don't have to go anywhere. There's no fuss, no muss. We get it to you. So it's so super easy. And one of their little sayings on their website is better soil better plants, better planet. I really could not have said it better. So I really like that. So I hope that you'll think about uh, ordering some tilth soil. I do want to mention the next month, and of course the weather will be gorgeous for June 6th. Uh, it is our uh, final meeting of the 2022-23 uh, year, um, meeting year. Uh, Tuesday, June 6th, and this is a picnic. Um, we have, you know, you bring your own food. We do have a grill usually started if somebody wants to grill some burgers or hot dogs or something. Um, the picnic begins at six o'clock and it is take, it takes place at the Lagoon Picnic Area in the Rocky River Reservation. Now, not only is it a picnic, but we also do a plant exchange. So if you have plants um, that you have taken out of your garden to share with others, it could be plants, it could be bulbs. Maybe you have some extra seeds left over from planting your garden. Um, perhaps you have some house plants that you'd like to split and share with others. Anything is fair game. So you bring your plants, have your dinner, examine the plants that are there, take, the, take some home, lots of orphans now. And then we have a bird walk starting at seven o'clock. We walk around the lagoon area and we generally have a really nice list for the, for the evening. So we hope that you can join us because this is really presented by you, our members and guests. So we hope to see you on Tuesday, June 6th at the lagoon picnic area at six o'clock for the picnic, plant exchange, and bird walk. But this evening, I know you're here to hear from the Cleveland Metro Parks folks. Uh, we have Tim Krynak, the Metro Parks Natural Resources Manager, and Dr. Nathan Beyer, uh, the Metro Parks Research and Database Manager. And they will be speaking on bird communities as bellwethers for habitat quality and disturbance. And just a little bit of information. Uh, many of you probably know Tim Krynak. He's been a natural resources manager uh, with the Metro Parks for a number of years. And his specialty, of course, includes bats. Maybe that's how you know his name. 
but also birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. He's conducted surveys of these taxa throughout the district, as well as region-wide for bats. He currently maintains both an Ohio Division of Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service scientific permit to conduct bat surveys for both the federally listed in Indiana and northern long-eared bats. Dr. Nathan Beyer, the Cleveland Metro Parks Research and Database Manager, is responsible for guiding data analysis and study design for monitoring and research projects across Cleveland Metro Parks. While his primary specialty is amphibians and reptiles, he leverages quantitative tools and models to address questions related to conservation and management of a variety of groups, including birds, mammals, and plants. Most, much of his research focuses on understanding how sensitive species may be impacted by environmental change and, predicted how, uh, and predicting how natural systems will change in an uncertain future. So without any further ado, please let us welcome Tim Krynak and Dr. Nathan Beyer. I will stop sharing and they will bring up their slide program. All right, thank you, Nancy. You're very welcome. Can everybody see us all right, the, the slides? So far so good, okay. Well, uh, it's great to see some uh, f familiar names in uh, in the the icons to the right of my screen. So we're we're doing two computers here. We've got one with the presentation on, and the other one we're going to try to um, uh, monitor the chat. So um, if you have any questions as we go, please just throw them in the chat, and one of us will take a look at that and try to answer those as we go. And of course, we'll have time at the end as well. Um, with that, there's also a lot of faces out there that you should know have contributed to this um, this work. So um, let's get the next. There we go. So there, these are all the people that actually helped do surveys for this project as well. So you can see some familiar names down there. Um, we much appreciated all the time and effort went into this this project, and hopefully at the end you'll see that it's, it has been a very worthwhile project. Um, Nancy did a great job talking about uh, myself and Nathan, so we're going to go by through this pretty fast. Um, believe it or not, um, June, the first week of June, is my 30th anniversary here at Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, so, so that's pretty exciting uh, and a, quite the milestone for myself. And yeah, as a, as a relative newcomer to uh, Northeast Ohio, so I'm actually coming to Northeast Ohio uh, previously before this from uh, Reno, Nevada. Before that from Madison, Wisconsin, and before that, before that, from uh, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. So um, as as Nancy mentioned, most of the time I'm working a lot on turtles, like you can see here, but uh, and did my doctorate work on turtles and my master's work. But um, we've really been sort of, since I've started here at Cleveland Metro Parks, we've really been pushing forward a lot of great uh, data and synthesis related projects that I think have some real potential for addressing how we conserve natural systems. And so sort of related to that, um, as basically wardens of, of natural areas, of natural park areas, um, a lot of times, a lot of our job is spent thinking about how we uh, protect against environmental change. And while climate change is often the, is typically, oftentimes if you think of environmental change, it's probably the first thing you think of, uh, as humans, we change the environment in a myriad of ways, even just by, you know, converting natural surfaces into uh, developed surfaces, into impervious surfaces. And so probably the approach for conservation that you might be most familiar with might be protecting a single species. Like we know this particular area is great for birds, and so let's protect it. And then sort of that protection might sort of trickle out to some other potential target species. Um, but that obviously sort of, if that's one end of the continuum, the other end of the continuum would be involved protecting entire ecosystems. Uh, and this might, the rationale for that might be more like, uh, we know that this forested area is relatively rare in this sort of highly developed landscape. So we should protect that. And by protecting that, we might protect a lot of possible species. Um, but as you can see from even the way I phrase those, this exists along a continuum and where 
as land managers or even just uh, in parties interested in conservation, you can fall at a variety of points along this continuum. And you know, this has been recognized in the scientific literature too, that there's kind of a, a continuum of approaches for how we protect species. On one hand, you even if you have just a single species model where you've got like a focal fish species that you see here, and you're trying to judge, you know, how much of that fish species you can potentially uh, take from one year to the other, uh, and how much you need to stock. Uh, you can integrate insights on um, just how the ecosystem as a whole is responding, how that fish fits into the broader, you know, predator-prey dynamics of that system, and use that to inform how you manage that single species. And beyond that, you know, just because you manage at one end of the continuum or the other doesn't mean that there isn't some sort of cross-scale uh, interactions here. If, if you protect entire ecosystems, a lot of times that can serve as a nice sort of umbrella for protecting conservation hotspots. So if we, for example, know that certain areas in the Cleveland area are hotspots for birds, by protecting those, we protect a lot of species at once. By the same token, if we know if we've already gone into an area with the intention of protecting a single species, that might be an indicator species or some uh, an indicator of sensitive habitat. And by protecting that, uh, we might that might have some consequences for the fate of the ecosystem as a whole. And so, in terms of how we translate these management decisions into monitoring priorities, you can probably summarize these in two areas. So, on one hand, by monitoring the whole system, we can predict. Uh, which species we might find in an area. So great ecosystem level monitoring data is provides a sort of critical umbrella under which we can capture which sort of species we might find. But by monitoring single species or even communities, for example, bird communities in, in our reservations, uh, we can predict habitat quality sort of indirectly based on what we're finding. For example, as an amphibian guy, if I go out to a wetland and find spotted salamanders, that tells me a lot of information. That tells me the upland area is probably at least not so disturbed that they can't spend most of the year underground adjacent to these nice wetlands where they breed in. So now let's jump into um, a little bit why we actually study bird communities. Um, and um, Marianne talked us talked about this a little bit in talking about climate change and um, the study of penology using birds is um, you know it is got ongoing and there's very good evidence that you know several species are moving north as uh, the climates change um, and, and there's a lot of great research on there. Uh, um, and the, these graphs on the, the right side of the screen, they're just, they're proof that some of this is ongoing currently. And they're also a frequent target for monitoring as well. And, um, you know, the Cornell has done such a great job of, of, of looking at climate change and um, managing for birds is quite difficult. And I like this quote actually from the USGS and maintaining diverse yet connected habitats can help migratory birds take advantage of different resources and phenological responses. Climate-induced change in, in phenology have important implications for a range of management activities, including habitat, vegetation management, invasive species control, prioritization, and um, differing vulnerability and climate impacts. So dealing with climate change is, is not easy. Um, so why use birds? Um, the USDA recognizes that that uh, that birds can demonstrate climate change. They're relatively easy to measure and identify. And this is just a graph actually showing um, how birds' abundance have changed as uh, the climate has warmed in the last, um, what is that now, uh, 40, 50, 65 years. And uh, a lot of these species do uh, are facing high risk of extinction. And uh, this is sort of just a, a, a pie graph showing um, how the birds break down currently. And that is changing very quickly as well. And of course, you guys all know that the, the, these birds are providing ecosystem services, um, providing pest control, sanitation, seed dispersal, pollination, et cetera. Um, basically that circle of life. Um, 
Bird surveys are nothing new to Cleveland Metro Parks, and a lot of you people have, have actually taken part in quite a quite a few of these, but A.B. Williams with his work in um, A.B. Williams Woods, the Wallens um, with all their work, especially down in Brexville, um, Tom Stanley era, he was very interested in old field surveys, a lot of hand-drawn maps we have available uh, for, of those surveys. Um, there was a winter bird survey, um, there was a breeding bird survey back in 1996, that was actually one of my first breeding bird surveys for the Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, Dave Dvorak in all of his years mapping raptor surveys throughout the park district. Uh, and when Dan Pettit was here, he uh, we did some misnetting project and some point counts as well, that uh, park flight project. Many of you guys uh, helped out in the Rocky River IVA project. Um, and we've done maps, which is sort of a breeding um, bird survey at the Canalway. We're actually misnetting and banding birds. So we have a rich, rich um, history of bird surveys in Cleveland Metro Parks. So why is this different? Why is this survey different and unique? And um, this survey came about when this Focus on Wildlife project was proposed. And uh, it was proposed to put wildlife cameras on 200 um, PCAP plots. So that's a, a, a vegetation plot I'll talk about in a second. Um, and these were randomly distributed throughout Cleveland Metro Parks. And currently we have over 18 million images that we are processing. Um, and it's giving us a lot of information. But at that time, Dr. Rem Mole, when he was here, he said, well, you know, I said, why don't we put um, a breeding bird survey on top of all these camera points? You know, we're collecting all this information. And especially because they're on these vegetation plots. So this is a long-term plant community assessment program. And they're monitoring um, the, the plants, but they're also monitoring other things, uh, um, including invasive species, deer browse, all these other items that we can now start looking as we build on top of those, those plots. So it was just the perfect fit to put these bird points on top of this uh, focus to wildlife and these, this permanent vegetation plots. And here's just some pictures of some of our seasonals over the years basically doing the work on these, these, these plots. Um, this survey is a pretty, pretty straightforward um, uh, breeding bird survey. Uh, one thing I do want to let everybody know that this was a presence absence survey. We didn't want to know how many birds were um, there. We just wanted to know what species. Um, so a typical breeding bird survey for, for Northern Ohio here. So we started June 1st um, and we tried to finish up before July 10th. Um, each site was visited three times by separated by at least a week. Uh, and they also were visited by at least two different observers. And, um, and the other thing to note that the surveys, there are fairly quick surveys, so we could do more points. They were only eight minute surveys at each site. And this map will just give you an idea of the distribution of those 200, in, actually 210 points that we com completed. So you can see a, um, they're basically throughout the Cleveland area. Uh, we have approximately 13,000 rec records, um, and we documented 109 species through this program. Um, so here's a little bit of uh, interactive here. So um, if you can, in your chat real quick, uh, give me what you think may be the most recorded species uh, through these four years of breeding bird surveys. Hmm. Give, give everybody a minute to give me a couple answers. Oh, Mary Ann, right on. American Robin was number one. Song Sparrow, what was number two? I don't remember. Northern Cardinal was number two. Okay. Eastern Wood Peewee was number three. Hmm. Red Eyed Vireo, number four. Tufted Titmouse, oh, it didn't, right on. Blue Jay, American Goldfinch, mm -hmm. Red Belly Woodpecker, Crow, <laughs> Black Cap Chickadee, and Downy Woodpecker. So, those people that in the chat, you got several of those 
Correct. Yes, so, good guesses. Yeah, so these are the most recorded bird species in, and um, we we could do a whole another program on detectability and things like that, and that maybe is something for future of why some of these are detected, not only because they're um, common, but other of them have uh, certain life histories that allow them to be detected more readily. Okay, with that, let's do what species were the least recorded. And we should say least recorded, but present. But present. So you can't suggest like something wild and outlandish that would never show up here. And these were all actually the same. They were detected only once. Wow. Blue-headed blue vireo. Hmm. Where? Oh, uh, I can't tell you. You know, I actually, I don't remember where the blue-headed vireo was uh, off the top of my head. Bottle link, that was in Hinkley. Cerulean warbler. Cliff swallow, which is sort of interesting. You know, that the population of cliff swallow has really increased through the, the Cleveland area. Common nighthawk, and this was in a very urban uh, park that we got the common nighthawk. Double crested cormorant, great horned owl. That was, I believe, in Millstream. Nashville warbler, northern perula. Prairie warbler, red breasted nuthatch. Ooh, at least bitter nuts. Oh, that's, that's, that's a one, good one. That's a good one. Oh, and I'll, I'll say least bitterns do nest here that we just did not document them on this survey. Red breasted nuthatch. That was, um, oh, I forget now. And Virginia rail. So a very diverse um, range of bird species. And so um, I am a, probably a data person first and foremost. And so when I sort of arrived at Cleveland Metro Parks and we started thinking about how to, you know, say something about, uh, you know, how these these managed ecosystems and an urban matrix, you know, how vegetative vegetation composition affects which birds we're finding and how we manage those sorts of landscapes, you know, I start sort of started breaking down what sorts of data sets we had. So. As we said before, we've got that breeding birds survey, um, which I sort of limited down to this set of 164 core plots that had really high quality uh, plant community assessment program data. So that wound up with about 103 species. So even limiting down that number, as we'll talk about in a little bit, even limiting down that number of plots, that only knocked off about six species. So we're really, the, the monitoring system as a whole is really doing a great job with, with capturing uh, a pretty good picture of the sorts of species we might have across our parks. Uh, we, of course, had the Plant Community Assessment Program, which, as Tim mentioned, sort of ranges from really higher level insights into habitat quality, maybe a little lower down thinking about, so which plants are tolerant uh, to a variety of habitats? Which ones are more sensitive? Uh, and you can think how that might be important for thinking about breeding birds, thinking about which ones we find in more tolerant plant species dominant landscapes versus sensitive plant species dominated landscapes. Uh, but this even goes down to, uh, you know, broad groups, ferns, sedges, flowering plants, tree canopy cover, um, small tree canopy cover, just it's categorized in a whole variety of ways. And while we aren't talking about this here, it even goes down to a species level, a, a vegetation species level, which is um, a fascinating extension for some of the stuff we'll be talking about here. And then we also have just so your sort of typical landscape scale uh, covariates that in my line of work, you often have information on just, uh, you know, how far from roads are you? How far from trails, from developed lands, from, you know, can we generally summarize some sort of index of landscape development? Uh, in this case, we use sort of a three kilometer buffer for this index called uh, the Landscape Development Index, or LDI, uh, but there are a few different ways to calculate that. And in terms of our sort of broad analysis questions and goals here, um, you know, so we, you, I'm just representing what we had before. We have our bird communities, our plant communities, and our landscape features. So our first question was just, where are we finding the most bird species? Using the birds to, to tell us something about the birds themselves, essentially, how they're distributed in space. 
But then we also wanted to say something about, you know, bird, do birds serve as indicator species? Do certain types of bird species differ in their habitat associations? Um, but for now, we're just going to focus on this sort of probably the easiest way to first approach these sorts of data sets is just by saying, let's let the birds sort of speak for themselves. Let's just see where we're finding them and how that varies across basically the Cleveland area. And so uh, the first thing that I often wind up thinking about when I'm working with monitoring data sets is uh, how well have we sampled things? Um, so often the first question you ask is, did we do a good job of sampling the plots? So at a plot level or at a sort of survey area level, um, basically this, this plot here shows for each, each reservation is colored, but they all kind of blend together as you look through here. But basically it's showing as a function of the number of visits, how many bird species we're finding. And what we like to see is things sort of leveling off into like a plateau. So you can see that for some plots, we, we did a better job surveying than others. As Tim mentioned, each was visited uh, a minimum of three times, a few, maybe only two times, but those would probably get dropped off anyway. Um, but some actually had some replicate visits that went out to eight. Uh, that allowed us to sort of say how much surveying is enough. Um, but if we start looking at the reservation level, you can see that even some of our somewhat more poorly surveyed reservations, like down here, we're still starting to get this nice flattening of the curve, saying that we're sort of reaching, you can think like satiation or what we often, what we call in the ecological data analysis world, like rarefaction essentially um, for the number of species that might be present. And if you look overall, um, if you're just thinking about all of the different bird species we might find as a function of how many site visits we have, even if we were to only go out to those 164 plots one time, one visit each, we'd get about 85 species, which is over 80% of the full species complement. So that tells us that we picked the, where these plots are located really nicely. And every subsequent visit just ensures that we're capture, getting a pretty good picture of which sort of species might be found there. And in terms of variation and richness across plots, uh, this tends to be kind of a messy way to look at it, at least initially, because so whiter dots indicate lower richness or lower numbers of species more red uh, indicates higher numbers of species. You can see it varies a lot. Each, each plot sort of functions a little bit differently. Um, but if we were to start asking at this sort of broad scale, what's sort of predicting how many bird species we find? Um, we you might have thought that it would be something like how much human development there is or how uh, at this really coarse level, how many rare species are there? Nope, it's actually the cover of tolerant plants. It's the no amount of sort of plant species that can tolerate a variety of, of environments. And so that might seem a little bit confusing. You can see it's sort of a weak relationship. Uh, generally speaking, number of species goes up uh, as relative cover of tolerant plants goes up. Um, but if you think about it, a lot of times what, when, we're, when we're talking about areas that have high tolerant plant cover, they're often, they might be these sort of urban backyards or these sorts of uh, planted areas um, that might have, that have sort of, that have what we might say a sort of high ratio of edge habitat. And there's a whole suite of bird species that we know will probably show up if, if we've got green spaces. Um, and so what this kind of tells us is that, sure, broadly speaking at a plot level, tolerant plant cover might predict a number of species that are there, we know not all bird species necessarily are equally uh, generalized in their habitat preferences. So there's other ways to look at this. And so we can also focus at the reservation level again. And we start seeing some interesting patterns once we do this. So the most species rich reservations overall are Rocky River, Hinkley, and South Chagrin. Uh, if we just were to plot these out, you can see that there's these sort of deeper troughs in some of these reservations like Washington, Euclid Creek, Garfield Park, but the, the peaks are pretty clear. Um, but this isn't necessarily adjusted for survey effort. Um, after adjusting for survey effort, if we were to at, say, what are the, after basically controlling for some of these reservations were visited more than others, the least survey or the least species rich areas are uh, Washington Reservation, Huntington, and Euclid Creek. But again, that's still likely a function of just how much survey effort went into this. 
Um, and at this scale, this is the really interesting thing. At this scale, once we start thinking about reservation level species richness, it's basically how high quality is the vegetation community? And it plots out really nicely. This is one of the one of the cleaner relationships I've seen, where Hinckley, Brexville, or basically it's we have higher uh, basically plant community based habitat quality and higher bird species richness. Washington, generally speaking, had lower uh, plant community quality and lower species richness. But it's important to note that we have some reservations that are falling right offside this line, in particular Rocky River and South Chagrin. And so if we were to plot this out on a map, uh, in this case, uh, just to keep you all on your toes, I, toes, I did lighter colors indicate higher species richness and darker quality colors uh, indicate lower species richness. You can see we have sort of hot spots here, Hinkley and Rocky River, like we talked about with Bedford and the South Chagrin, both having fairly high richness as well. And so uh, to summarize that sort of first question we were asking here, uh, we found the most bird species in Rocky River, Hinkley, and South Chagrin, um, and we found some effects of vegetation quality and survey effort, things that we didn't, that we weren't necessarily that surprised to see. Now we sort of want to go another level deeper and start asking at this point, what do, what does the presence and absence of these birds tell us about their habitat associations and about the landscape around them? And so we're going to be identifying birds that are associated with particular habitat features and doing the opposite, identifying habitat features that predict where birds are found. So to start, we're just going to be focusing on birds that are and how they're associated with particular habitat features. And so uh, I like including this caveat in uh, talks where I have to do anything that is a community analysis related. There's some things called ordinations incoming. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to get away from these uh, if you're working on uh, ecological communities because the problem with ecological communities is you've got so many different species. We've got 103 species, some of which are going to respond in similar ways to environmental gradients, some of which aren't. And so uh, that's inherently what we call a, a highly multivariable or multivariate data set. And so these ordination approaches are basically a way of summarizing these sorts of complicated data sets and compressing data that might have lots of variables, lots of birds down to a more manageable number of, of basically axes, ways to look at things. And they're often used mostly for data visualization, um, uh, basically a way of saying, sure, the species might be sort of chaotic if you look at them as a big cloud, but let's see how they fall along these sorts of linear gradients. And so, for example, let's say we go to an area and we have data on three or more bird species. Uh, in this case, let's just say it's hooded warbler, pileated woodpecker, and song sparrow. Um, those species might be coming up again in a little bit. But uh, we could use ordinations to discover uh, basically where these three species are found. The idea behind this is maybe these three species are sort of, if we were to look at the where they're found in points, it's kind of complicated. Uh, you know, species C goes off this way and B and A go off in different ways. If you imagine shining a light through this and putting it onto it like this sort of, sort of a page, essentially, this is a way of sort of shrinking down those relationships into a more manageable number of, of dimensions for us to look at these. And we'll be specifically showing these in the simplest ways we can. So for example, if we just say, so how do the birds sort among plots? And we use something called multidimensional scaling to look at this and just say, so how are birds scored along the first axis for this ordination? Um, and in this case, I've got each of these species, the relative loading along this MDS-1. Uh, we have tropical migrants coded in blue, short distance migrants in green, and uh, red is year-round residents. Um, we won't get into those rankings all that explicitly here, but we basically establish these in collaboration with, uh, with OBCI and, uh, and Matt Schumar specifically sort of helped us come up with, with, with which rankings we wanted to use here. Um, you can probably tell already, we've got a heck of a lot more blue off this direction and a few sort of interesting uh, red species, year-round residents showing up in this direction than in this direction. 
Um, and sure enough, if you were to look at just my, the scores for each of these species or for each of these groups, see migratory birds uh, tended to load much more positively along here than uh, tropical migrants, or I call them NE here for neotropical migrants, um, and resident birds as well. So what this is telling us initially is even without thinking about habitat, tropical migrants and to a large extent resident birds too are using different flocks a lot of the time than our short distance migrants. And so then we can start saying, so we know what our ecological communities look like. So let's make this a little bit more complicated and say, all right, now let's see which bird species are associated with these different ecological communities. And while this looks sort of chaotic and there's lots of arrows pointing in different directions, the main thing to notice here is that this green circle here for mesic meadows is really, really different uh, from a lot of these other areas. Um, and we've got some interesting species that are associated here. We've got purple finches, we've, we've, we've got uh, alder flycatchers, a, a whole suite of birds that we, we generally speaking uh, in Virginia rails as well, um, are species that are associated with music and wetland habitats. Um, and many of these are maybe what we might call somewhat more rare species or species that maybe we, we need to do more survey effort for. But it's really clear that they're using very distinct habitats and community types relative to a lot of these other groups. The next most sort of differentiated group is maybe this wet meadow and marsh group up here. And then after that, this, um, I believe this is oak mixed hardwood forest circle down here. But you can see just how distinct these wetland associated bird communities are. Um, that's not necessarily gonna be a focus for the rest of the talk because we admittedly have to put in more survey work on just what's going on with these mesic habitats and the birds we're finding there. But this was an interesting finding. And then finally, if we were to just start saying, so how are these birds related to all of these different PCAP covariates, these vegetation covariates, landscape development? Again, we wind up with these different arrows for where these landscape variables, these descriptors of how the plant community looks, uh, all these arrows sort of pointing different directions with these bird species in different positions along here. But I think it's still fairly noticeable that our tropical or neotropical migrants are often, if we were to think about birds that are grouping most strongly along some of these environmental gradients, um, it's often tropical migrants. Uh, and if we looking at landscape development index, so remember this is more developed habitats as, as you go down this way, you can see some things we'd expect, American robins, house sparrows, um, and so already, you know, just looking at this, there's some priority species that seem to be particularly differentiated along environmental gradients, including Acadian flycatchers, hooded warblers, Louisiana, Louisiana warblers, ovenbirds, scarlet tanagers, and theories. Just as a, and I have to admit, I'm not a birder, uh, kind of by, by I, I am, Prior to this project, like I had not even heard of these four letter abbreviations, uh, and now I'm a lot better at figuring out what those mean. Um, so I'll be rattling those off as best as I can. And so now we sort of establish which sort of how birds tell us something about the plant communities around them and the landscape features. But really as, as managers, we want to sort of and, and wardens of, of public lands, we want to think about what habitat features predict bird occupancy and potentially use that for, for broader scale prediction overall. And so what I use for this um, is a suite of approaches called occupancy models. Uh, you may or may not have heard of these before. The idea behind them, is that, so they're presence absence models that basically unlike sort of traditional statistical approaches where you sort of assume that you did a perfect job of finding whatever, basically if you went out to an area and tried to find your target species or communities, yeah, a lot of traditional modeling approaches would assume you did a perfect job of doing that. Occupancy models basically say, we know that we didn't find every bird species. We know that we didn't positively identify every single case where a bird was there. Maybe it just wasn't calling that day all that well, or it was just kind of sneaky or, any variety of things might have interfered with that. Um, and we're running sort of a, an extension of 
So typically those are single species models. We're running a multi-species model that considers both the community level trends and occupancy and the single species associations as well. And so this is sort of gonna proceed in some general steps that I'll walk through for us. First, we're gonna run these different models of occupancy and detectability. We're gonna rank the models by how well those fit the bird community itself. We're gonna plot out uh, habitat relationships for each species to see if we see any consistent patterns, and then potentially uh, predict where birds are found in Cleveland Metro Parks. And as a spoiler alert, I would say we pretty much accomplished all these goals. But we're gonna start with these first two here. So we ran a whole suite of different models, occupancy and detectability, and rank the models by how well the models fit. And the top model by a large margin wasn't just human development, it wasn't just what the vegetation looks like, it was a mix of the two. And it included some covariates like you see here, in addition to others, uh, included tolerant plant cover, uh, basically the number of fern species we had, the number of uh, dicot species, flowering plants that we had. Um, flowering plants is actually duplicated accidentally there. <laughs> this is supposed to be sedge. The second little flowering plants here, this is a sedge. Um, we also have landscape development index or LDI and distance to developed land cover. Um, so in addition to that, I, while they're not displayed here, we had some interesting covariates show up in here, like non-graminoid monocots, which might sound like a very fancy term. It's basically uh, a lot of times it's trilliums, lilies, a lot of these sort of disturbance sensitive or development sensitive uh, understory plants uh, that are still monocots. They're still in the same sort of general grouping as a lot of grasses but they're, they're not grasses themselves. So next we sort of plot out these habitat relationships for each species and explore those. Uh, so at the community level, so the nice thing with these models is that they give you a community level prediction and species level predictions too. And so uh, this might look a little confusing at first. So the color schemes are, are trade it around a little bit just for uh, to get a more colorblind friendly palette for slightly more complicated plot. Um, so orange is a resident birds, green is our short distance migrants, and blue is our tropical migrants. Um, and basically the, the point, the black point is the whole community wide estimate of effect. And these bands around them are called credible intervals that overlaps with this line. It means at a community level, maybe it's not the strongest predictor. So there's some things that come out here as clearly pretty strong predictors of, of just species richness, essentially, the number of species we find. Um, this includes percent open canopy cover. There's actually a positive association between positive percent open canopy cover and the number of species we're finding, which is really fascinating. Interestingly enough, a negative relationship between non-graminoid monocot species richness and overall species richness, um, uh, bird species richness, that is, but I would note that uh, our tropical migrants and our residents, they definitely are are way more towards this end of the graph than our short distance migrants. And then uh, dicot species richness, um, as you can see here, uh, is, a, is a positive predictor. So that's great. The more diverse our plant community is, the more bird species we might find. And then finally, the distance to develop land cover um, is negative, which means that actually, uh, interestingly enough, the closer we, as we sort of saw at the plot level before with species richness, the closer we are to develop lands, the uh, more species we had. But this is one of those covariates that's particularly different for short distance migrants relative to residents and tropical migrants. Tropical migrants, if anything, uh, basically this would suggest that a lot of them would much prefer to be far, far away from, from, develop, from human development. And then finally, the, the number of species in the genus Carex or, or Sedges. Um, and so to pull out some of these, generally, we found positive influences of uh, tolerant plant cover, uh, but very weak, negative influences of Carex, a nice positive relationship with the number of dicot species and sort of middling relationships uh, with LDI. And so a lot of what this tells us more than anything else is that um, we have to keep in mind that these are basically averages. This black dot is basically an average across the whole bird community, which 
it doesn't take much to see that's a little silly because we know that a Virginia rail is going to use habitat very differently than, Amer than an American robin, which is going to use habitat very differently than a hooded warbler. Um, so we need to probably go a little bit deeper and start thinking about what, how these associations break down by species. And so we start, as we start sort of getting more and more at sort of a finer scale here, we can just pull out four species that I think are, are a nice sort of point counterpoint example. So Cadian flycatchers, their green lines, hooded warblers are sort of golden line, pileated woodpeckers are red, and song sparrows, uh, since it's just a little brown bird, essentially, is, is our brown. Um, and you can see that um, actually for these species, most of them, three out of these four species, are significantly negatively associated with landscape development index, so the amount of human development. But song sparrows have the exact opposite relationship. Basically, they actually kind of like developed landscapes. They, they sort of, there's probably a lot of human subsidies, resource subsidies in those areas. And if we were to look at, for example, fern cover, uh, we again can see sort of divergent responses here. In this case, we see Cajun flycatchers and hooded warblers are positively associated with the amount of fern in a particular vegetated area. Um, pileated woodpeckers maybe don't care all that much, sort of a flat line, and song sparrows are negatively associated because, again, they, they don't mind the sort of urban-suburban interfaces. And tolerant plant cover, too. You can see sort of either weak or negative relationships for all species other than song sparrows, which are positively associated. And so a lot of what this tells us is, uh, in particular, it looks like there might be some groups within tropical migrants that are less likely to be present in these uh, highly developed areas. Um, and even some resident species, like woodpeckers, we're sort of consistently finding that they're not a huge fan of human development either. Like they, they are maybe a little bit more, have much more specific habitat requirements. And so all of this is sort of aligning with our expectations uh, thus far. And you might be asking, what about short distance migrants? Um, so if we were to just plot out sort of a panoply of different short distance migrants here, so American goldfinch, blue gray gnat catcher, brown headed cowbird, and gray catbird. Um, and again, so goldfinch is in gold, blue gray gnat catcher is in sort of this blue, brown headed cowbirds in brown, and gray cat, uh, well, I guess it's more of a red, and uh, gray catbird is in black. We can see that basically, Goldfinches, gnat catchers, cowbirds, they're just really common across the landscape and they don't really care if it's if there's human development. They could really kind of care less. Uh, great catbirds, if anything, they, again, they're maybe slightly less abundant on, in the landscape or less likely to be present, but uh, they are actually positively associated with human development. And then same case as before, for fern cover, we see uh, they either don't care, or if anything, they prefer areas that have less ferns. Um, and tolerant plant cover, too. They either don't care, or they're positively associated. Uh, and this is, we should keep in mind here that their short distance migrants made up the bulk of the species that were included in this. I think it was like 38 versus 38 short distance migrants versus, I think, 31, um, th uh, 31 uh, tropical migrants. Um, so there were there were more short distance migrants in this data set overall, um, and they vary tremendously in terms of their responses to human development. But many of them, and a large group of them, appear to be uh, either somewhat generalized or, if anything, uh, urban adapted. And then we can also even just sort of visualize, this is just sort of visualizing this across a much broader array of species. Um, so this is every species that we had that had a significant association with at least one habitat covariate. Um, so, and we can group these along, for example, open canopy cover. So if it's up here, it means it's positively, that the probability of finding a species was positively associated with open canopy cover. Down here, it's negatively. Um, you can probably tell pretty quickly that a lot of these species that are grouping up here as positively and significant. So as another note, um, if, it's an, if it's a closed circle, it was a significant association. If it's an asterisk, it was the, the bar is overlapped with zero, so it may or may not be significant. Um, 
But you can see that a lot of these are those mesic wet meadow associated bird species that we saw before. So, you know, but interestingly enough, some of these are morning doves, but we also had purple finches and indigo buntings sort of grouping along here. Um, and I will just call your attention to some of these species down in this quadrant, because we do have Acadian flycatchers, hooded warblers, scarlet tanagers, red-eyed vireos, oven birds, dark-eyed juncos as falling, maybe not significantly negatively associated with open canopy cover, but noticeably. Keep an eye on those species because they, they sort of keep showing up. Uh, such as in this case. So if we were to look at dicot species richness, basically indicator of how rich the community of, sort of flowering plants might be within uh, a particular plot. You can see uh, that hooded warblers, Baltimore orioles, eastern towhee, indigo buntings, eastern kingbirds, Acadian flycatchers group a little bit more towards the middle here. But most of these species that have positive associations with dicot species richness are tropical migrants again. And this is just showing that these migratory groupings do sort of have these coherent, different responses to, to uh, environmental gradients and these different levels of habitat specialization. And then finally, we want to sort of uh, represent how these, one of the best things about occupancy models is they're used for prediction. They allow you to predict if we see a similar plot, are we likely to see that species there? And remember, we had 400 total PCAP plots, of which only about 210 were actually surveyed for birds, 164 were actually included in analyses for birds. So we wanted to predict out to that full 400. And with that in mind, we actually have created a little interactive app that we're still sort of polishing up, but are, we're going to pan over to that now and reload it. And um, we're, we would, would love to get some it has to load for a minute because it's hosted online. So if you would, if you have a species you would like to see on this 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 model, so this is predicting where certain species should be occurring, and also it it, it also will basically predict detectability as well. So um, the first one that you see right here, this is the Acadian flycatcher in Rocky River Reservation, and if you see the high green color, that's where it's more likely to be. Um, uh, and if it's red, it's likely not to be there. So if anybody has a species they'd like to see, just throw it in your chat and um, we can pull it up really quickly. Otherwise, we're just going to pick some fun ones that we think are illustrative. So you can see that alder flycatchers really don't show up in Cleveland Metro Parks. And our model basically says that they probably shouldn't be showing up very common. Red-headed woodpecker, that's a great one. So red-headed woodpecker is still fairly rare across the landscape overall, but we do have some areas. So, and as we <clears throat> look at this, so this is one that I would suspect that it should be picking up more of. So that's again, it's it's when we're looking at um, making this better, we have to find these species that we we start to question. Well, why isn't that showing up? I see them all the time in the Rocky River Valley. Scarlet tanager is a nice one. Yeah, scarlet tanager. We have a lot of great information. So again, the the more green, the more likely um, you're going to find scarlet tanagers. Pileated woodpecker. That's another good one that I think I just saw. Affiliated woodpeckers again. So interestingly enough, I mean, so we just went from a, a few from scarlet tanagers, a tropical migrant, to affiliated woodpeckers, and you'll notice again it's this urban interior that keeps showing up as having more red a lot of the time. Rose-breasted grosbeak. That was Rose a good one. Speak. Yeah. We don't have a, a lot of um, yellow-billed cuckoos. I don't think that's going to show up very well yet, but that's another one that we need to take a look at. Yeah, so rose-breasted grosbeaks, you see some of our larger reservations overall, like uh, Bedford in particular, you've got some sort of green hot spots showing up there. Let's see, Eastern Towhee, that's another good one. Sort of similar distribution overall, we're seeing it more in sort of our larger reservation areas. And we can pull up the old old cuckoo. Yeah, let's try it. Just for the heck of it. 
Yeah, we did okay. With yeah. That. And uh, one thing that we were not focusing on as much, but we do also have sort of plots of of basically what's the sort of what's the influence of these different covariates on where we're finding uh, this particular species. So like uh, yellow-billed cuckoo is, was actually positively associated with open canopy cover. Um, so the more open canopy cover there was, the more likely, well, generally speaking, we were to see yellow-billed cuckoo. But if we were to go back to Cadian flycatcher, that's a nice indicator of a, this is a species that uh, showed up quite a bit in the surveys. And you can see these confidence bands here, these credible intervals are a lot narrower because we, we did a good job of characterizing them. Let's, um, let's go on to the next. So we're gonna move on to, so how can we start using um, this model um, in Cleveland Metro Parks for, um, uh, for what we want to accomplish? So go ahead and let's get, so for example, Acadian flycatchers in Hinkley. Acadian flycatchers keep coming up as a, a really this flag start, this, this species that's, it, we, we have good detection in it and we have enough detection that we can start doing some pretty good predictions. So um, you could see we're in, that's Hinkley Reservation, um, where the high probability of where they were be, where they should be, but then you could see um, do you have the next up here? This is a new property, and it uh, there's basically no records of Acadian flycatchers because we haven't surveyed. But maybe um, if we survey, we should be able to find fly Acadian flycatchers in that um, that new property. And same thing with hooded warblers. Uh, this is a, a a little bit more on the western Cuyahoga side, but you can see that they show up down in the big chunks of Mill Stream down by West One Thirtieth. Um, and then through the core, we don't have them, but we've got this one little spot up by um, Bagley Road that the model is suggesting that there should be hooded warblers. Um, so this is uh, an area that um, we should be looking for them to see if they actually are utilizing that. Yeah, and so this is the real potential for this model, I'd say in particular, is projecting out where we expect to see things based on habitat associations. And so if we can sort of summarize these associations overall, that for, you know, we can use these birds to predict community types and habitat characteristics, particularly disturbance. Um, and we're also finding a whole suite of covariates at the plant level that predict which, which species we find. And in, in addition, indicators of landscape disturbance. So um, how are we planning to use this? We're, we're going to be using this information um, to help guide land management practices. I saw a couple uh, questions in the, or comments in the chat regarding power lines and herbicide and mowing. And we really are want to be able to utilize uh, these models to help um, guide us in our land management practice, um, both for uh, uh, common as well as rare species. Um, and this all this information is actually also very valuable when we're making our cases for land acquisition. Um, we do a lot of uh, funding through different uh, grant opportunities. And to be able to say, especially birds are um, are highly fundable anymore. So, so when we apply for a grant, even though we don't know, haven't visited a property, um, we can now start making um, uh, estimates of what what species could be on that property. And it just makes our application more um, valuable. And uh, this is also, we're working with the All Ohio Conservation Plan, and we can start using this information to fill in some of the gaps um, of the, uh, that are found in this plan. So if you look down, I mean, you can see one of that top species on this um, plan is actually the wood, wood thrush. And we have a, actually a lot of great information on wood thrush throughout Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, one that we are really interested in, and if you go down, is the American woodcock. I think that's in there somewhere. Um, right here. Yep. So that's one that we're really interested in. And so is um, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service as well. So that's one that we don't have a lot of information on, but it's it can start um, guiding us to where our, our research efforts are, are heading as well as um, management as well. Um, but you can see here, again, this is our uh, um, distribution of our, our plots through uh, Cleveland Metro Parks. And really what this, this work is telling us is that 
um, even if we look at this little block here uh, that has a gradient of you know urban area to some uh, some park lands and some open areas, um, this is a zooming in. Um, you can see that the Cleveland Metro Parks are so very important to um, the bird communities, especially these neotropical migrants. And it's really demonstrating how important um, maintaining the health of Cleveland Metro Parks is for, for bird communities as a whole. Um, some future type of monitoring that we're also uh, going towards as well is we're, we're the acoustic monitoring and uh, artificial intelligence is becoming better and better. Um, we can put out a remote recorder in some remote places um, and actually um, get some very good information. We did sort of a small test to see how well these recorders did compared to humans last year. And actually they compared very well. You, actually, we couldn't really even tell the difference. I was a little worried that some of these recorders would miss some rare species, but they actually did pick up these rare species. We're also using um, a program called BirdNet that actually starts um, auto IDing them for us, which saves time so we don't have to go through hours and hours of recordings. We can actually start looking for target species um, utilizing these recorders as well. We're also um, involved in the MODIS network, if you haven't heard about MODIS, but it's a wonderful network that continues to grow. We have two towers in Cleveland Metro Parks one on um, uh, at Huntington Reservation on top of the water tower, and the other one on the offices at the uh, Cleveland Lakefront. Um, and we are working, um, well, one of our target species right now is the American woodcock. So we are working on tagging more woodcocks that are picked up by Lights Out Cleveland, taken to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, rehabbed, and then we are fitting them with um, little radio transmitters uh, to see um, where are they going after they have been rehabbed? And so to sort of bring all this home, you know, I think one of the things that I think I'm most interested in as a as sort of an ecologist is that is just like the inherent complexity underlying these ecological systems. Um, and and oftentimes you can look at this diverse variety of species and think, how the heck can we even sort out where, where some might be found and what some might not be found. And so part of the job of, I think, of, of these sort of quantitative approaches is to make that, those, these complicated systems more manageable uh, by providing insights into how they sort along environmental gradients. And with that, we'd uh, be happy to take any questions. So we've got a couple questions in the chat regarding some land management stuff in there. Great. So am I just sending them to Sarah and not everyone? Oops, I think you just click on there. I don't, there we go. I don't know if I was set. So I apologize if I wasn't sending it to everyone. Um, it looks like Nancy's asked, she would love to see some more large grassland and early sectional fields. We do have some grasslands um, in um, in Hinkley, and we uh, through the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're maintaining a few large areas in Bedford now under their power lines going towards that areas. Um, early successional fields are uh, our target for us. I really wish we had um, more information on some of those species uh, to do a better job of modeling them, such as blueing warblers and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, so those those definitely are on our, our radar um, for management, and hopefully um, you'll see an increase in that type of management in the near future. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Well, while you're looking through those questions, or if people are still typing questions into the chat, um, first of all, Thank you. This is fabulous information. Uh, have you presented this at any uh, other meetings, professional meetings, ecology? We're, uh, we're, we're hoping to sort of make the rounds essentially with it because it's, I mean, so these, these occupancy modeling approaches are really becoming, you know, if you can use them, they're, they're immensely powerful. Yeah. And you might not be able to represent every species with these multi-species approaches, but the fact that you can 
you know, because it varies by survey effort, but they just tell us so much about where about so many high priority of yeah. species and groups. And Nancy, we actually used this program as a catalyst to get this started, to get it put together so that we can start offering it. So we appreciate um, uh, having the opportunity to speak with your group and present this. Um, so hopefully, yes, we are looking to, to go on the road show with this in the near future. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think Hinkley, I think the, the park has gotten, what, at least one golf course out there now? Mm -hmm. um, maybe a couple of others? I don't know. Is that right? So the the um, we have, well, in Bedford, we picked up Astrohurst. Uh, so the, the the one thing that's interesting, Nancy, is that a lot of times when we're getting these golf courses, there is um, language in it on how we can actually manage the land. Oh. Um, and the, the, the property that we just picked up in Hinkley, the golf course, actually has to be maintained as a golf course for the next 10 years, I believe. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> you know, where we would love to to take it over and just do what we would like, um, there's some restrictions. Um, we also have another uh, golf course that we're probably acquiring in in um, bed. Where's Hawthorne? Hawthorne, so that's South Chagrin. Um, that's a pretty large golf course. We'll have some opportunities to do some some different habitat management there. Um, as a resource management group, we know that as you as somebody mentioned in the chat, that grasslands and early succession um, are a priority. The one problem we have is that um, we don't have large enough areas to make suitable grasslands. You really need ten acres or more, and we find that some sometimes hard in certain areas to do that. I have one question in the chat. Are there rusty blackbirds in any of the parks? Um, rusty blackbirds, of course, are declining. We don't have any that nest here, um, but um, Cleveland Metro Park is a very, very important staging area for them in the springtime. Um, some of our uh, wetlands are, um, I, I often see large flocks of rusties in, in, um, in the spring. So they do they don't nest here, but they we still they are still utilizing Cleveland Metro Parks um, in the mostly in the spring. Yeah, the park systems, um, you know, of course, you think of wintering or non breeding times. You think of breeding seasons, and then of course uh, the the uh, migratory stopovers. So I, I find that that wetland behind Southwest Hospital follows marsh is, wow, the, the uh, rusty blackbirds come in there to roost right now. Yeah, so that's, you know, we really, this this project is really focused on the breeding birds, but the, the value, that's one thing that we're trying to stress a little bit more about the value of some of these um, migratory stopovers. That's why I think when you guys are out and you're e-birding, that is so valuable to us. Uh, e-bird, e-bird everything you can, because again, we are, there's more and more funds becoming available for migratory species. And for us to be able to say that, you know, look at these species, they're using a fowl's marsh or things like that. It really leverages us um, in acquiring some of these funds for future conservation. So appreciate all the e-birds that everybody on your team does. Yeah, we were even in in communicate in conversations at one point about using eBird as a means of sort of stress testing the model of essentially of saying, okay, so if we're predicting that we see hooded warblers in areas where we just don't have a whole lot of great, you know, our own breeding bird surveys, but it's got a high probability of presence there based on the model. Are we seeing eBird records in that area? So that's another sort of source of information that we can use to calibrate the model. Yeah, wonderful. You know, the Spring Bird Walk series, there's eBird data that goes back 60, 70 years. I mean, <laughs> probably before the forests were starting to grow up <laughs> and, you know, how, how the habitats have changed in some of these uh, uh, areas. So, yeah. you know, mining, mining that eBird data, yeah. 
Yeah, it, that is, you know, we just had a conversation the other day. We were out walking, actually, Ann and Dwight, you were out there, if they're still on, and really talking about how our bird communities has changed. But, you know, over those years, the landscape has changed, too. Right. So our bird right. community is changing with the landscape. Right. And um, it would be really nice to have more um, professional ornithologists at a local university to start really teasing away some of those information. And um, I think that um, the National Park just got a new biologist, and she is a bird biologist. And um, she did her PhD um, using MODIS technology. So I'm really excited to have her in the Cleveland area uh, to really start digging into some of the, the, the bird research that can be done in this region. Yeah, I believe her name is Mariamar Gutierrez. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I'm interested in the MODIS information too. I'd like a presentation about that for our next speaker series. Yeah, um, so. we, she would be a good one to reach out to. I could do something, but not very in-depth. It definitely wouldn't be a full presentation. Right, right. Yeah. I do see someone mentioned the uh, effects possibly caused by deer. I mean, I think that's Personally, that's one of the, the sort of areas of inquiry I'm really interested in um, is it's not just deer, but sort of generally starting to think about how, you know, like our bird communities are not in isolation from the broader array of, of vertebrates and plants and everything around them. And so starting to think about, you know, like Nancy was mentioning, where there's areas with substantial deer browse. Is that affecting uh, like you know, presence, absence of certain birds, essentially? Um, I think th that's sort of an interesting additional area of extension for some of it. Well, I don't want to keep people too much longer, but uh, this was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Breyer, I don't know how long you've been with the Metro Parks now. One year. One year, all right. <laughs> Look at all you've accomplished. This is this is exciting. I I, I really love this stuff. So, um, but thank you so much, and I want to thank all of our people who joined in this evening. I hope you've come away with uh, a little bit of information, a lot of information, um, and but thank you ever 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 so much. And thank you all for attending. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Good night, Nancy. Good night.